when I was growing up, I was, I was very lucky. I, I always knew what I wanted to do. I loved nature, uh, I loved the bush, and I particularly liked, loved wildlife, animals big and small. And from an early age, I had a special fascination with the outback, a place where I judged that nature and wildlife would be in abundance. And from the age of 15, I was able to go out and start doing wildlife surveys on some of our most remote places. And since then, 30 plus years later, I've been able to work in some of my extraordinary, beautiful, remote places. Perhaps places that you've been lucky enough to go to yourselves. Places like the Kimberley Coast, or the Great Western Woodlands in the southwest or perhaps even the Simpson Desert in the arid heart of Australia. Now, in all these places, there's a common link. The common link is people, or rather lack of people. People are sparse or absent. And quite possibly, you would think that a deep, dark green conservationist like myself would actually want more national parks, more wilderness areas where people were absent. But that's not the case. In fact, a problem for a lot of our wildlife in the outback is not too many people, but too few people. And this was first driven home to me when I went to the Kimberley in the northwest of Australia for the first time. And there I met two great Australians, Jimmy Pike and Pat Lowe. And Jimmy, who's passed away now, was a well Majari man whose home country is in the Great Sandy Desert. And Jimmy grew up there with a fully traditional lifestyle. And Pat, his wife, co-wrote many books on desert life with Jimmy. And when I was there, I had, had a wonderful day out in the bush. We were just hanging out, doing a bit of hunting with Jimmy and Pat. And in the afternoon, I was walking along and I, I literally almost stumbled into an animal burrow in the red dirt. I looked at it and I, I didn't know what the animal was that had made the burrow. So I called Jimmy and Pat over and Jimmy glanced at it and said, Middleuju, Middleuju. And Pat Pat glanced at me and translated, and she said, it's a bilby, it's a bilby burrow. And I was, quite, I was quite astonished and shocked. I had never expected to see bilbies in the wild, even signs of bilbies in the wild, because they're now so rare. But for those of you who don't know them, bilbies are a rabbit-sized Australian marsupial. They have peculiar features, Look at those ears, look at that tail. But as a whole, I think they're just gorgeous. <laughs> just gorgeous. And after we'd seen the burrows, Jimmy and Pat then told me the extraordinary story of when the Walmajari left their country and what happened to the wildlife. For the Walmajari progressively left the Great Sandy Desert from the 1940s onwards. And the 1950s, some of the few families left which included Jimmy's, noticed an extraordinary thing. What they saw was that as the number of people declined in the desert, as they left the desert, so did the number of some of the animals. And we now know that this not only occurred in the Great Sandy Desert, but in many other places. The details vary but elsewhere in Central Australia and Northern Australia, as the pattern of humans changed in the outback, animals have declined. And as Pat said, as we packed up to leave that day, when the Walmajari left their country, some of the animals went missing as well. Now I think this picture really tells the story of what is this link what is the link between people and wildlife? And this is, this is Jimmy Pike, again, and he's on a 
brief visit back to his country, and he's deliberately burning the country, and he's hunting. And yes, that's a feral cat around his neck. Aboriginal people burnt the country in very particular ways, generally doing small fires throughout much of the year, creating a patchwork, a, a mosaic of differently aged pieces of bush. And that mosaic provided the food and the shelter for species like bilbies and other animals. And when people have left the country, we now often get wildfires started by lightning, covering huge areas of land, degrading the habitat, and species disappear. And the people, of course, also hunted, including feral cats, as we can see here, and introduced foxes and other feral animals. And the native marsupials do not have good defences against these introduced predators, and the Aboriginal hunting probably helped the species like the bilby by keeping the populations of the ferals down. We're now on a planet with more than seven billion people. And those seven plus billion people, us, and our needs, mean that increasingly nature and wildlife is scarce and under pressure. But that general truth can obscure the fact that in outback Australia, we have one of the very few great natural places left on Earth, along with the Amazon forests, and the Canadian boreal forests. But in our outback, there are now fewer people on the country than at any time in the last 50,000 years on most of the outback. And by on the country, I actually mean in it and managing it, dealing with fires, dealing with feral animals. And we now have a situation where much of the country is simply not managed. Fortunately, over the last 10 years or so, there has been a quiet revolution to bring back people, to bring back land managers. And it's been, it's been a really great joy of my life to be a small part of that. As part of my work with a conservation group, Pew Charitable Trusts, we help organisations bringing back people onto the land. Groups like this, this is the Wadikan Ranges, they manage a gem, an absolute gem of the outback, a million wild hectares just to the east of Kakadu National Park and the Territory. It's the Wadikan Indigenous Protected Area. It's a park on Aboriginal land and the rangers are now have come back, they manage the fires, they deal with feral animals like water buffalo, the bush is healthier, and wildlife, which has declined, like emus, are coming back. And there are now dozens and dozens of Aboriginal ranger groups like this operating throughout Australia. And they're combining traditional knowledge, Western science, and using modern equipment and modern technology. And it's not just, I'd emphasise, it's not just Aboriginal groups. We have effective management of government-run national parks. There are many cattle station owners doing a great job managing their part of the outback. And we have non-government conservation groups like Australian Wildlife Conservancy, and here you can see uh, Bush Heritage Australia, who buy large areas of land and manage them as wildlife reserves. This work has been excellent. It's making a big difference. But it is still just a small portion of the outback. We need to do more. It's, it's sometimes said that people need their country, that people who've got an attachment with the land, with the bush, will be happier and healthier, and I very, very much believe that. But the opposite, I think, also applies, and it certainly applies in our outback, in our heritage, and that's that the country needs its people. Our outback is one of a tiny number of great wild places left on our fairly crowded planet. 
But if we want to keep it healthy, if we want to keep our extraordinary wildlife there, we need to bring back people into all of our outback wilderness. Thank you.